Hello friends, subscribers, potential subscribers, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. On God's first day of creation, he spoke things into existence with his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. He spoke the word. In Hindu, it was Om. In Egyptian, it was Song. In old pictures of Sumerian reliefs and tablets, you can see them sometimes holding what looks like a pine cone, and they're using sound and vibration to move megalithic stones. The study in science today is called cymatics, and I highly recommend you check it out because it's very cool. Now, in the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, it was pure darkness, and God's spirit was there. He spoke revelatory light into the darkness, he separated his good light from darkness. And now, Genesis, the second day, the mysterious firmament, the dome, and the flat earth? Here it is, just like the first day, Genesis. Let's read the second day in English first. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Right off the bat, you might notice that in the first day, God called his light, his revelatory light, good. He doesn't tell us either way here good or bad, well, with this one. Now, what is this word firmament? In Hebrew, it's rakia. Um, in English, what do we hear of these two words? Firmament, we hear firm. Rakia, we hear rock. This might mean nothing, and it certainly doesn't allude to the definition, but as we'll see today, there are some interesting sidebars here that can't be ignored. Today I'm going to be sharing facts with you, but I'm also going to be sharing a unique way of looking at scripture beyond exegesis, where we take the Hebrew ancient pictographs with the Hebrew alphabet, the English word equivalent, and the transliteration, and sometimes we glean additional meanings out of them. I've made a viral video before where I showed how the word Bereshit contained the Son of God and His sacrifice right in that first word of Scripture, and I'm going to do a little bit of that today. I'll let you know when we're going from fact to speculation. So anyway, firm, firmament, rakia, rock, but we can't trust those at that because it doesn't mean that. But it certainly is interesting, and we might come back to it later. The firmament has created controversy both in Christian circles and fueled movements pointing to the fact that there might be potential differences in the mainstream theory of the heliocentric globe Earth. And as we'll find, this great mystery can be solved. Uh, further, it may shed light on the uh, flood of Noah, for example. Let's briefly touch on the ancient pictograph of Hebrew. The Hebrew alphabet, the English meaning of the words. While this is not a way Hebrew is read by scholars, there's an interesting etymology that reveals even more truth. So first, firmament is the word rakia. In the first example, I'm going to point to what I had done in a previous video. From the word bereshit, from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, we get aleph, bet, resh, shin, yod, and tav. And when you use the pictograph meanings, you can put together a sentence that says, the Son of God is destroyed by the work of his own hand. While this discovery might be ancient, in the modern times, a, a civilian named John Costick really needs to get the credit for discovering this type of interpretation. Another one comes to us from the genealogies in Genesis 5 by Dr. Chuck Missler. And it shows how the names listed in the genealogies when their meanings are taken, form an interesting sentence about the later gospel. Well, so who do we have in those genealogies in Genesis 5? We have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, uh, Mahulalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Adam means man. Uh, Seth means appointed. Uh, Enosh means mortal. So anyway, when, when you take all these different names and define them, you end up with something that says, man is appointed to mortal sorrow. 
The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing relief. That is fascinating, isn't it? Now, firmament from day two, rakia. Its technical definition, firmament, is extended surface, expanse, uh, sky. So, uh, it has the analogy of something being beaten out and crafted, made. The two words that appear over and over again are water and expanse. It reveals to us that whatever the firmament is, God made it. Rakia, Rish, tells us the character and authority of God in this case. Kuf, we think sun on the horizon, um, back of a man's head, circle, circular, dome, which Yahweh made his footstool, correct? Yud, to work by one's own hand, the functions of the heavens, because Resh, we're talking about God in this case. And finally, On, to watch, to know, to shade, to open eyes. Very interesting, right? So, Rakia, we get Resh Kuf Yod On, right, to get our word there. Now, the word Rakia appears 17 times in the Old Testament, and the Hebrew seems simplest of all in its direct transliteration compared to translation. Um, expanse and water, expanse and water, several times. Um, another term relative to this expanse of water is uh, ether. Unger's Bible Dictionary says something interesting. It defines firmament um, as God separating the water on earth from the water above in the form of clouds. The problem with this is it presumes the writer possessed any awareness of at atmospheric uh, patterns when this was written. Um, did they know the clouds made rain? Uh, perception of the senses certainly mattered then. And to them, it looked like a dome when they saw the lights in the sky and they looked from horizon to horizon. Uh, to them, the Bible was a flat earth book. L listen carefully. I'm not saying the earth is flat. I'm not saying we're right today that it is or isn't. But to them, the earth was a flat earth book. The argument is made today by some that the Bible is a flat earth book today too because you can't have it inconsistent, you know, looking at it one way then and one way now. Another argument made frequently today is that the Bible contains over 200 proofs of there being a flat earth. And like I said, we're not here to prove or disprove that today, but to verify that to the earliest writers of the Bible, the Bible was a flat earth book. Unger's dictionary goes on to say, um, that expanse is a, syn a synonym for what is called the ether. Um, ether is the regions of space beyond the Earth's atmosphere, uh, but it's also a class of uh, organic compounds in which uh, two hydrocarbon groups are linked by oxygen atoms. That basically means that in order of days, chemical bonds may have pre-existed animal and human life. That's very interesting when you think about it. Yet we get a few interesting clues a little later in Genesis that point to the idea of uh, atmosphere as the upper firmament as a pretty weak definition. Um, the Bible says there isn't even rain until much later. Listen to Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses uh, uh, 5 and 6. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb in the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Well, that's interesting. Why would we have clouds uh, and define the day two language as an atmospheric system so far ahead of the effect of such a system, like rain, uh, weather patterns? The Greek Septuagint refers to firmament in the second century BC Greek as Stereama, meaning uh, some compact mass. The Latin in the Vulgate has firmamentum as um, uh, prop or support. This is an interesting connection to what we see later in Job and the prophets uh, about the earth being stationary on pillars and God using the circle of the earth as his footstool. Either way, the Hebrews viewed firmament as stationary and firm uh, and capable of withholding the waters above. Uh, when one reads the beginning of day two, it can give the impression that because firmament sounds like firm, uh, that it is stiff, stable, and solid. 
Uh, it would be easy to read the first part of day two and say, Oh, the firmament, firmament is land. God separates the waters below like oceans and seas from the waters above like creeks and streams and mountain lakes. But as we read ahead, we can see that that can't be the case. Let me just read you the first part of day three, which we'll cover in another video. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So now, <clears throat> the canopy and the firmament and the water above it is stable and strong and held above it. Now he's talking about the firmament and the waters below only. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And God called the dry land earth and gathered together the waters. He called the seas and God saw that it was good. So we're back to good on the third day. But you see how that erodes Unger's dictionary in connection to the idea of it being uh, cloud systems. So the firmament above, what is it? Where is it? And what is it doing today? There's no sun or moon yet because they don't come till day four. There's no stars yet. It doesn't come till day four. In all languages, we get references to two ideas, water and expanse. Aguas and uh, expansion in Spanish. The Latin gives us that word super again. If you remember from the day one video, the cool part about reading this in Latin is you're constantly getting reminded that this is talking about a supernatural creation, not an attempt to organize the thoughts of the Bible into man's naturalistic frameworks. Uh, it's a firm explanation for uh, supernatural creation in a way that uses divine force to utter creative... God uses his word to utter creative power into action and motion, into time, space, matter. Given the focus on water and expanse, one can't help but think of Noah's flood. Listen to what it says in chapter 7, verses 11 and 12 about the flood. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. The dome was opened and water from above came down and in. And the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Wow. Now, you could think there'd be a dramatic change in the atmosphere then, right? Rakia, Rakia has changed. The firmament has been altered. So on day one, God brought revelatory light and the expanse of darkness and brought the cycle and order to it. Um, a supernatural move of God. We're reminded by the Latin reading that it is a supernatural process. And again, during the second day now, uh, back to day two uh, of Genesis in chapter one, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Uh, and God made the firmament and divided the water which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. The under and above is the other clue we should have that this is not talking about a separation of waters on our horizontal plane or horizontal whatever we are, whatever our shape happens to be. And God called the firmament heaven also, right? Uh, and the evening and the morning were the second day. This seeming reality about the firmament talks only about water and expanse and is totally separate from below the earth uh, to above in the heavens supported by a dome uh, to keep the upper firmament out. Uh, this has been used to argue a closed system uh, by flat earth proponents because of the dome. There are two things I do find interesting on that note. Um, the modern space program cannot send manned space vehicles, manned space vehicles beyond 450 miles up because of what are called the Van Allen radiation belts. They're very dangerous. Uh, they damage the astronauts uh, by pumping them full of radiation. But uh, in modern times, the government uh, had a clandestine operation called Fishbowl. Think of that. An interesting Fishbowl to test high altitude nuclear weapons. Fishbowl is an interesting name for a high altitude nuclear test, isn't it? Um, they were able to send unmanned missiles about 650 miles up. Uh, interestingly, Fishbowl as a subject name uh, was viewed by some to reveal the idea that there's a closed system. Why else would they call it that? So 
Interestingly, first what they observed was electromagnetism near the Earth was much different than it was at high altitudes. Um, high altitudes explosion cause auroras and green lights, but all in different spots around the globe, not necessarily even near the test site. Uh, as far out from the blast ge geographically across the world, really. Uh, the cause was not determined and it wasn't part of their preliminary predictions as scientists. Uh, charged particles in the explosion expanded the magnetic field as if it was barred from further altitude. It didn't go up and out. It went outward and downward. Very interesting. Um, the electromagnetism and perhaps gravity or the ether caused what is called an EMP. And see, the EMP knocked out electronics for thousands of miles away. The energy of the bomb came down toward Earth and it had nowhere to go except back down. It didn't go upward. It spread out and down. Let that sink in because potentially this can be used to support the circumstantial idea um, that the Bible is talking about a dome and a closed system, uh, not open to deep outer space. Finally, uh, Logos Bible Software, their description and graphics showing the Earth as described in the Bible show what appears to be a flat plain covered by a dome. Uh, this was brought to the attention of the public by a scholar and theologian named Rob Skiba. I have also spoken with a couple representatives from Logos Software and had a similar conversation. Um, Rob questioned what we can make of it, that their chart uh, is supposed to be an accurate biblical representation and they stand by the veracity of the Bible, but none of them will say they agree the earth is flat today. That is an interesting inconsistency uh, that, that is to be pointed out. Um, so to its end, though, it would suggest that the earth must be something other than some heliocentric uh, heavenly body governed by momentum, unless the earth did start out as a flat plain with a dome, the fountains were opened, the dome was filled in with water, uh, over time, gravity took over and the shape of the Earth changed and the wildlife and everything changed as a result of the Great Cataclysm, the Great Flood, which many people equate to the Younger Dryas, which happened about 12,000 years ago. You can look up the uh, work of Graham Hancock to learn more about that. So, firmament, the waters, expanse, land and sea, the second day of the Genesis account. Finally, we have to be very careful about making comparisons that say, well, back then they believed this, um, but didn't really know the real systems of evolution or physics, if you believe in evolution. Uh, to say that puts us in a dangerous situation because uh, maybe they didn't know what clouds were or that they created rain. But remember, we believe the Bible is divinely inspired, that God breathed out Theanustas, his word, through the writers as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, Book of Peter. They're not inspired, and God is not all-knowing if the natural world changes without anybody, God, the writers, being aware. Therefore, we have to trust what it says to be consistent. Ladies and gentlemen, this was an awesome discussion. Uh, if you want to, check out the video where I do more work with this transliteration of the old Hebrew characters. And please listen to me again. I understand it is not exegetical. It is subjective, but I find it very interesting and mysterious and secretive. And it's just kind of cool to play with it. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. May your work today bear fruit. Talk to you next time.